Hey, podcast listeners, in episode 65 of the Pixar Post podcast, we're going to talk about our trip to Pixar Animation Studios for the Toy Story 4 press event. We're going to share our discussion, the recording from our conversation with Josh Cooley and Mark Nielsen, the director and producer. We're going to talk about Toy Story 4's French premiere, Wee oui, Wee, oui, and the Monsters at Work show, a follow-up on our podcast that we did two episodes ago about if shorts are done. Dun, dun, dun. And more. So you know how we start these things, right? Oh, no. Did you get a, a trivia question for me? I did not. Uh-huh. Well, are you ready I for your... I could think of one. Are you ready for your questions? Okay. So the last time we did this, it was Presto-themed. Now, oh, since... Oh, let me guess. Toy Story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's... It. You know what? You know what, guys? We've been together 20 years. I can almost read his mind. <laughs> it kind of makes sense, though, doesn't yeah. it? This episode is about Toy Story. So there are three questions. Okay. First question's about Toy Story 1. And you can get the where I'm going with the rest. Right. Um, again, leave a second. Don't answer right away. Okay? okay. First question from Toy Story 1. What is Sid's sister's name? I know it. Okay. Hannah. <laughs> oh, Hannah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, perfect. I wondered if you if I wondered if it was going to be one of those ones that like sometimes when I think of it off the top of my head, I think of Janie because he says Janie when he makes her like what That's happened to Janie the doll. Yeah. So sometimes my head thinks Janie at first, oh, but I know I, it's Hannah. Yeah, because I I always think of Woody saying <laughs> Hannah, Hannah, oh Hannah. <laughs> Toy- mom, what is it? What is it, Mom? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Keep doing the rest. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I love it. Um, Toy Story 2. Oh, man. Now I'm getting nervous. I got Toy- one right now. I feel like it's going to be all downhill from here. Toy Story 2 won the Golden Globe for Best Picture, Musical, or Comedy. How many other Pixar films have won this award? The Golden Globe? Yeah. Uh, that's like since Toy Story 2? It, or you could include Toy Story 1 Seven. if you would like. I just threw out a number. For best picture, musical, or comedy. Oh, best picture. One. Which would be? Toy Story 3. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, man. You think one other one has, though, right? For best picture? Correct. Oh, no. I don't. No other ones? No. That is correct. Yeah. There are no other Pixar films. What's annoying is that if you look up trivia, it says there are... Two other Disney films that have, but I was thinking Toy Story three was nominated, I believe. But I was thinking there's been many other films that have been nominated. I know, but that's but yeah. So this has been something that has been bugging me for a while. At this point, it's like I understand back in the day why they put Disney Pixar on there. Mm -hmm. At this point, it needs to come off. (laughs) It just needs to be Pixar. Well, you were talking to me this about this what today or yesterday, Uh, or you said, well, they don't call it. Disney Star Wars. It's not Disney, Disney Marvel. Lucas. Disney Marvel. Right. Yeah. And it's, what is it going to be? Disney Fox? Yeah. So it's not. I understand why they did it back in the day. Yes. But, but now it's time to relinquish it. And what started this is that we were playing HQ trivia and it was Disney Heroes trivia night mm-hmm. this last Sunday. Which we were so close oh man because it was it was you it was answering questions until the final at least 25 people were left yeah we were down to like 127 or something like that we were so close oh it hurt it hurt didn't even have to use an extra life no we answered like 19 or 18 or 19 yeah yeah oh man but uh anyways um yeah it started with there because the very first question was about the incredibles and i'm like well the first three out of five where yeah. Pixar really Yeah, and questions. I'm like, I'm sorry. Is this Disney trivia or is this Disney Pixar trivia? Because no other question was about any other franchise like Marvel, Star Wars. Yeah, this is where we started talking about yes. it. Yeah. It was like two nights ago. Yeah. And and again, I know they're all owned by it, so it's not a big deal. It's something that's always but it always you a it's always bit. bothered me. Um that and planes. Not the movie, the fact that it's within the Cars universe and uses those yeah. types of characters. Um, and then this, mm-hmm. um, that it's one of those things that Disney attached themselves to it when they needed it, but they chose not to in any future things. But again, I know it all shouldn't matter because it's all the parent company anyways. Mm-hmm. 
I just don't like when people confuse my Disney with my Pixar. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So, Toy Story 3, you ready for this question? Oh, goodness. In Toy Story 3, Lotso tells the new toys they must stay in which room at Sunnyside Daycare? Are you... They are staying... Okay, so they're in the Caterpillar room. Okay. And Lotso's in the Butterfly room. Okay, there you go. What? (gasps) Three out of three. (laughs) Woo! Ooh, yeah. <laughs> Why were you? Uh... Because I thought it was so like, it felt so easy, but then I felt like I was being tricked. <laughs> so that was kind of the, that's why I asked the second question of how many other Pixar films have won that award. Okay. Yeah. Um, beca- you know, beca- for Toy Story 2, because I was like, oh, well, I'm not, I'm not saying which other ones have won. I'm like, how many other? So I already kind of led you down the line where I wanted you to say more than one. Okay. Okay. I kind of, I have a a question for you then. Okay. Trivia question. Yes. Kind of kind of to the Disney Pixar that you were just talking about. You boy. Okay, the end of Toy Story 1, like the original Toy Story. Yeah. When they fly back into when Buzz and Woody fly back into the car, what song? Is, Hakuna Matata. Oh, I thought I was going to get you. <laughs> Did no. you just read that tonight when no. you were looking up trivia? No, I know that. I know a lot about Toy Story 1. I know you One. do. I know you I mean, do. I guess I screwed up in the last episode about the release date when I hurried up and said A Bug's Life when I knew it was Toy Story. But regardless, but yeah, I mean, the amount of times we've seen Toy Story. Yeah. There's just no better feeling than when that movie comes on, is there? No. Which is why we're super excited to talk to you in listening to this about Toy Story 4 today. And so... I, I'm going to give you a little bit of a sneak peek as far as what's coming in the upcoming episodes of the podcast. But today, again, we're going to share our recording, our conversation that we had with Josh Cooley, the director, and Mark Nielsen, one of the producers. Jonas Rivera was not able to be there the day that we were because he was at CinemaCon. Yeah, in Vegas. Uh, showing the first 17 minutes of the film to that uh, group. But here are some of the things that we talked about. So the first night... What I'll kind of do is, I guess, uh, talk through some of the experience of it, like we usually do when we come back from these press events. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, it was, as always, amazing. I mean, you're walking into Pixar, and you're seeing all the sights. You're smelling it. Like, it has, like, a, a certain smell. It has a certain aura about the building, and it's exciting whenever you're there. The probably one of the things that I'm most excited about that we're going to be able to share is on the second morning we got there and where everybody else was eating breakfast because the studio store was closed. I ran, grabbed my GoPro, hooked up all the mics and everything and did a full tour of the grounds that we're able to go to. Yeah, I was respectful. I didn't like look in any like office windows or do anything silly like that. But I did go from the parking lot all the way through the Steve Jobs, like, building entrance, like, outside there. The common area. The common area to the Brooklyn building around by where, like, the the basketball court and volleyball and pool is. And then went back inside the Steve Jobs building and even went into, like, the fridge inside the the cereal room and did things like that. So it was – I'm excited to be able to share that upcoming tour video that we did. I think it's, like, 20 minutes where I just walked around, got to get some really cool footage with the GoPro – Hero 7 Black, which, holy cow, the stabilization on that out of the box is amazing because I did some <laughs> awesome walk-arounds around the Heimlich that's outside of the Brooklyn building. Oh, yeah. Um, the choo-choo train. Yeah. But some of the other stuff that uh, we got to do when we were there. So there was a session about the evolution of Toy Story World. So it talks all the way from Toy Story 1 to Toy Story 4. Um, so it was really kind of cool getting the history of it from Bill Reeves and um, Bob Polly. Bob Polly. So that was neat. Then we got from start to finish creating a scene in Toy Story 4. It was essentially like the pipeline project that we did for this podcast, but Mm -hmm. it was just regarding Toy Story 4. So that was neat. So we'll share some of the audio recordings from all these sessions that we're talking about. Then there was one just about Bo. So Bo is back. How did they redesign her? What were they going to do to to set her apart? And what was her backstory? Uh, There was one about it's all in the details. So this is... um, the, the little details that are the graphics team and the shet, the the shets, <laughs> the sets, sets shading <laughs> team came up with. Then there's outside the toy box, um, 
which they talked about like the sets. So going to the antique store, going to the carnival, what the the sets were like. We got to make our own forkies. So that'll be kind of cool just to talk about. I mm-hmm. won't dive into that. And then the thing that really got me excited, we've already been to the archives. You've been to the old location of the archives. Correct. This is now my second time going to the new location for the archives. Bragging. Yeah, well, <laughs> I am bragging because I was so excited that I got to go there and see this archives tour geared towards Toy Story. Yes. So the last time I was there. It's kind of funny that, you know, when we started our website and you said, gosh, if we ever, ever get to go, if they ever do something with cars again, if they ever do something with Toy Story again. Yeah. All my dreams have come true. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) They have. Because I I thought there was never a chance that there could be a reason that I would be going there for a Toy Story film. Right. Never a chance. And I was... Well, yeah, because we started our website long after Toy Story 3. Well, two years. Yeah. Two years after, so not terribly long. Not terribly but, long. But, but yeah, you just wouldn't expect that. And we're going to actually talk about that comment because nobody would expect it. Josh Cooley shares that he didn't expect it. So it's kind of cool that what you're going to hear um, in this. Well, don't the best things come when you least expect it? Aw. <laughs> <laughs> That's touching. Isn't it? <laughs> it is true, actually. It is true. Yeah, I know. Um, That's why I said it. Oh, all right. <laughs> all right. Um, so, yeah, uh, the, I, I, I'll give one little, like, precursor to it. There's two things that I just can't not tell and give a little precursor to that I was so excited to see this. One was that uh, the, the last time I was there, I got to see Sid's original sculpted head. Mm-hmm. This time I got to see Woody and Bo Peep's original Toy Story 1 sculpted heads that were completed. And like they had like, again, like the vertices lines, the X's and Y's where they had mm-hmm. to like, instead of just 3D scanning it, they had to touch it. Right. A pen to it to like bring it into the the computer. Amazing. Amazing. You can see how it's falling apart. And the archivist is talking about how they were never meant to be archival. So they're going to eventually, they're going to do what they can. To keep it, yeah. And try to keep it. But yeah, Bo Peep's hair is like stuck on with sticks and like, you know, parts of it. It's a, It was incredible. Then we got to see the other thing that I can't, I can't even believe it. Yes, a lot of amazing artwork, but the board that Pete Doctor nailed his shoes to and used as reference animation for when they did how the Green Army men would walk since they have their feet, you know, on the plastic together. Right. Like melted together. Like melted onto like their base so that way they can stand up. I just couldn't even believe it. We've seen it in like behind the scenes videos. Mm -hmm. I've never... I know when you I called me that. that night, you were freaking out over about the archives. Shoes, and yeah, about shoes nailed to a board. An old pair of tennis shoes that are disintegrating, you said. Oh, yeah. And you could smell them, too. Yeah. They were old Nike high tops, all black, nailed to a board. Just Isn't... to like, what, like a, just a piece of plywood, kind of. Yeah. Yeah. But it was incredible. And you said like <laughs> it was like all packaged nicely. Oh, yeah. You yes. said it was like Toy Story 2. Custom fit. Oh, yeah. This is custom (laughs) Custom foam. You know, custom foam. We're traveling in here. Bullseye. Uh, Yeah, it was definitely very customized. It was um, foam that had which side it goes on. So it was like all angles of it had foam that went around that held the board but didn't touch the shoes. And then there's a there's a picture of this Mm -hmm. and there's a picture of me like looking into the box because I made it into several photos for the first time ever. At right. one of these press events, my photo, I'm in them because they have a photographer that goes around and takes some photos. Um, but yeah, so you can see me looking into it. Um, but the foam, it even has like, it says like, you know, like tip of shoe, base of shoe, like so that way you know which direction it goes in the box too. Yeah, that's cool. It was really cool. <laughs> There's some really cool stuff I'm going to be able to share. Like every title that they were uh considering for toy story for toy story yeah every title they had a sheet of paper that was from the meeting where they determined it and i read them all off onto my recorder because i'm like i don't know when i'm gonna see this list again right 
<laughs> yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I was reading it super fast and everybody else is like rolling their eyes at me like I'm being a complete like, come on, let's move on, people. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm like, you're I've fangirling. Got, I've got a podcast to 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 of dedicated people that want to know this stuff. <laughs> and me. <laughs> you stand Toy Story. I stand for Toy Story. Um, you said so, it wrong. I stand Toy Story? No, it's not stand. I stan. Oh, I stan it's, Toy yeah. Story. That's what okay. all the kids say now. Oh, I, I got it. What's the T? <laughs> I'll tell you. I'll, I'll teach you. <laughs> um, okay, so let's talk about some other things. We've been doing a bunch of Toy Story videos, so a lot of the products have been hitting store shelves. We even took a trip to Canada. Yes. Yeah, that was really Which was cool. Really exciting. Yeah, what was what was exciting about it for you? Well, it that when we walked into tw- well, first off, not getting grilled by the TSA. The oh my gosh! Controls. Oh my yeah. goodness! Well, again, they're doing their job. I shouldn't say again, but they're doing their job. They're doing a good job oh, at it. Oh, but they like we were like we're going to Toys R Us, and they're like it's closed. They all closed, and we're like no, we promise it's open. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I felt like a criminal, but uh, it was it was I actually was stumbling all over my words. Usually it's funny because I'm usually super calm in those scenarios, like, and I can keep my composure. Uh, Like when we interview Pixar people, you know, like when we first started, we would get really nervous, but then Mm -hmm. like, no matter what, this is my first time in a decade that I've gone to Canada. Yeah. And it's Canada's literally 40, 45 minutes (laughs) away from us. It's like, right yeah, it's, it's not like, far. Yeah, you go to Detroit and you cross the bridge. It's so close. Yeah, but um, it's just funny because I'm not used to that. Yeah, so you know, Windsor is right across the you know right across the bridge, and it it was literally probably like what an hour tops with going through. Oh yeah, you know the yeah. border and everything. It was easy peasy. So easy, so close. But um, holy cow! First off, the cleanest Toys R Us I've ever been to. Uh, one of the cleanest stores. I mean, granted, it was a smaller one. It was, but it was super nice. Yeah, and it had a Babies R Us attached to it. Attached, yeah. Which that was kind of crazy still seeing that that even, you know, was bought out. Yep. And um, the workers actually said that Toys R Us Canada was in, um, like, closeout just like it was here in the States. But that Spin Master. Yeah, the toy company. The toy company is uh, headquartered. It's a, Can- a Canadian company. And they bought all the Toys R Uses in Canada. Yeah. And they kept them open i mean i'm sure they closed a couple of them but yeah they definitely did some restructuring but yeah they were the employees kept coming over to us and they're like are you guys from the states because you seem way too excited i know (laughs) (laughs) apparently americans are overexcited. yeah (laughs) but everything was like put away on the shelves nicely it was wonderful the the store was super bright I it mean, I don't know if it was just the Toys R Us. I mean, we probably had five that we We've frequented. Been, I mean, but think about it. Even when five we or would, six that even we went when we were on road trips, we would yeah. stop in at Toys R Us's. Have yeah. you ever seen one like that? No. Right. Like they would all have like <laughs> half the lights on. <laughs> yeah. No. This one was like, I mean, like walking on the sun. Yeah. It was so bright. It was and so then, clean. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, you guys. They played the jingle. The yeah. Toys R Us kid. Multiple times. Yes. I was like, what is this? I know. It was great. The yeah. employees were all... They super had friendly and helpful. Super friendly. They had... Cart- Again, we were in Canada. <laughs> they're, so. <laughs> they're known as being friendly. Yes. But yeah, they had like these little carts that had all the stock that they were putting away. Every shelf tag was 100% centered under the product. Yeah. The products were all pulled right to the edge of the shelf, yes. the front edge of the shelf. On like every, every aisle. aisle. Not just the Toy Story section. No, because that was like aisle. the main, yeah. Yeah, it was amazing. Yeah, it was really cool. We did go into another store. What was it? Mastermind t- Toys? Yeah, it was kind of like a Discovery Channel store. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When they used to have their stores. And we yeah. went into there too. It's a toy store like in the same plaza as Toys R Us. Yeah. And it was super cool and unique as well. Yeah. It was really fun. It was really cool. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, if you like McDonald's, go to McDonald's. It's yeah. amazing. <laughs> yeah, we went to McDonald's. Just because we're like, we want to see if they have different stuff. Because, you know, in every other countries, you always hear like p- them saying like, oh. Yeah, and you know what? They're bringing like five items. Not that we're huge McDonald's fans. But <laughs> no, but still, I mean, <laughs> but, we don't hate it. Yeah. We're, yeah. Not, we're not endorsing nor denying yeah. <laughs> McDonald's on this official podcast. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but they're bringing like five items from around the world to be, I don't know if it's limited or what, to be on the the US American. One? Oh, cool. Yeah. It's like cheese fries from Australia, a couple different things. 
I would love like a lot more of their vegetarian options because I um, used to work with um, a girl from India and she talked about how great the vegetarian options say, were yeah. there. And I was always jealous of all these great like veggie mixes and all these other things that they had. Um, yeah. You don't eat a lot of meat. You've, yeah. I mean, what people don't know about you is you were a vegetarian for quite a long time. I was. I was. I just. Uh, Not me. <laughs> no, Julie likes meat and potatoes. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> and, and tacos. And tacos. Um, yeah, meatless tacos. Not as inspirational as meat tacos, but regardless, yeah, the McDonald's was great. It had like the, the bun had poppy seeds and sesame seeds. That alone just says how great Canada is. Yeah, you get we both. Just, you get both seeds on top of those buns. Yeah, we even went to a Walmart <laughs> to look for the Toy Story Four toys. Oh, Walmart was so weird. It was so weird. It was literally like stepping into a Kmart from the eighties. Oh, a hundred percent. It was. It was the Kmart from the eighties with Walmart, like branding. Yeah, and our buddy Giovanni came with us because mm-hmm. he lives close to us, and so he's like, "Oh, I'll totally go too." So we went in there, and he was pointing out the fact that Walmart was not blue. All the price tags and the roll down tags and everything were red. It was literally like a Kmart. Yeah. So it had to be like, you know, I said, I said, it must just be that Canada loves their maple leaves, like the red color of like, you know, their, their flag and everything that they yeah. just changed Walmart to be all red. Yeah. It was weird. And it, it, and I mean, I know the United States is known for like, you know, excess and stuff. Oh yeah, the land of excess, of course. The Walmart was small. Like the food section it was, was small. smaller. Yeah. Like everything was like smaller. It could it just be the of, area we were in. It could have been. We I were mean, just in Windsor, so I right. mean, who knows? It's not. But it was it was interesting. But no Toy Story four toys at the Walmart. Yeah, that was a bummer. Yeah. Um. But the other thing I said too, which was kind of eye opening, why was there not a huge section of Duke Kaboom stuff in Canada? You are right. Yes. Oh, yeah, that's right. Giovanni was around when I was saying that part. You weren't. Yeah. We, yeah. Why is there not like Canada's greatest stuntman at Toys R Us? Oh, like, my goodness. Right? Well, that is a marketing fail. <laughs> these are the what things, the heck? These are the things I think about. That's a genius. <laughs> that's a genius? That, that's genius. Sorry. <laughs> that's, that's a, a genius. genius. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. I mean, they better sell the... I wonder, the Toy Story collection Duke Kaboom is listed as coming. Do you think it'll be exclusive to Canada? I doubt it, but that would be cool. Yeah, that would be cool. They got to do something. Something, yeah. Yeah. So, um, But we also bought Kinder Eggs in Canada. Don't out us. (laughs) (laughs) Kinder Eggs, if you don't know, are not supposed to be in the United States because children might choke on the toy inside of them even though they're not designed as a take a bite of this giant egg you're supposed to crack them open and then inside is a teeny toy like it would be inside of a box of cereal or anything like that plastic correct and scoopable cream right in in america there's two halves to the egg one half has the toy one half has like the chocolate but in canada and in europe and every other country but here the toy is in the middle of the egg and you crack the egg and the toy like comes out and you just eat the chocolate around it and they're delicious i actually kind of like the the cream ones with the little scoop better of course you do (laughs) because i'm american (laughs) (laughs) um so that about sum up our trip yeah Okay. Uh, hopefully you guys found that interesting. Yeah. If not, we just wanted to reminisce about our, t- <laughs> <laughs> um, our three so, hour trip to Canada. So yeah. So we're going to be doing more of those video posts. We still have toys that we've found to do unboxings of. Um, oh my gosh. Seriously. We have so many Toy Story 4 toys in this house right now. And we're gearing up. The books are coming out next week. So we're going to have the books to do too. Um, so stay tuned for that. There's going to be lots more of those videos. I've loved people's feedback on them. People are like, oh my God, I didn't even know all this stuff existed. The only thing that's a bummer about not like doing the in-store experience is that it's kind of all over the place in the sense that we might find two of the seven inch lines on one week. The next week we find two more from the seven inch line. Yeah. So they're not all in one video. Whereas if we buy them and bring them home and do the video, it's you know, all the seven inch line and then all this or all the toy story collection. So it's a little, it's a little more scattered, but it's also fun just to kind of see what we've been. And you know what we really, what we really need to find is that, um, giggles, Polly pocket play set. 
Yeah, I don't. It's not out yet. Yeah. Uh, at least I, I don't think it is. I don't think so either. I, think I saw it tried on, looking it up, and it's I don't. It's on Entertainment Earth, and I think mm-hmm. they say it comes out in May. Okay, we have to get that. Of course, it's gonna be great. Yeah. <laughs> but we haven't bought. We haven't bought everything. We have no because we're, we. <laughs> that's trying, a lot of money. We're trying to be more responsible. Um, we but, have bought quite a few. Sure. But we can't. We can't buy everything. No, we can't. We don't have. A well, money plus, there's tree. a ton. Yeah. There's like. 20 different versions of Bo. There's like 18 versions. I mean, Dan the Pixar fan is doing great summaries on his site as far as like all the versions of Bo and all the versions of Forky. So yeah. if you're looking for that, check that out. But um, let's uh, let's move on. Yes. So let's talk about Toy Story 4 at the Annecy International Film Festival. Um, so at the Annecy Festival, which is from June 10th through the 15th, the Toy Story 4 is going to make its official French premiere before the American premiere um, on June 14th at 4 p.m. local time in France. So Josh Cooley will be in attendance is what it says. I am I have to assume somebody else will be along with him, mm-hmm. like whether it be Mark uh, or Nielsen Jonas. or Jonas Rivera. But uh, yeah. I believe Inside Out did the same thing. They did. I think, yeah. yeah. Inside Out definitely was. They were at Annecy. So people are going to be able to check it out at Annecy ahead of time, and I'm jealous. <laughs> I know you are. <laughs> The other thing is, is I think we're going to need, like, if you remember when we saw Toy Story 3, they released Toy Story 1 and 2 in 3D Mm -hmm. that you could see ahead of time. Right. Wouldn't that be awesome? They're going to do it. If they did Toy Story 1 through 4 in theaters all at once. They're going to do it. Really? uh, They have to. If not, that's a second marketing fail. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know if a lot of people would be up for Four movies in a row. It has to be like a limited, it has to be what, uh, Fathom event? Fathom events, yeah. Yeah. That would be awesome. Yeah. It's going to be like a limited small theater for whoever wants to do it, but it needs to be like a Fathom event. Incredibles did the early release of Incredibles 2 if you Mm -hmm. went and saw the double feature with Incredibles. Right. Um, And people that I was with really loved it. Like I brought a whole like, bunch of people and they were like, this is great. I've never done this. But that's going to be like, what, eight hours? It's a long time. Yeah. I you mean, know, with each like Toy breaks, Story movie is like 90 minutes. But, but with breaks in between. But with breaks, absolutely. I mean, it's like eight hours. That's a long time. That's what I mean. I would absolutely do I, it. You would have to just do it. But I would I would love every minute of it. Me every too. minute. But I don't know if that's going to I don't happen. think our son would sit through eight hours of, and nor do I want him to watch eight hours of <laughs> Screen time. He can watch eight hours oh, yeah. of Toy Story. That's fine. <laughs> it's a, it's it's for research. It, this is true. Yeah. Um, there's also uh, some other news there. So we'll be excited to see what the early reports are from Annecy. Mm-hmm. And then we'll, we'll hopefully have an earlier press screening as well. So hopefully we'll be able to share some news for you as well. Um, but uh, a Toy Story themed restaurant is coming to Toy Story Land, and you wrote a post about that today. Yeah. So it, what what about that? So the Disney Parks blog just announced just kind of a snippet of information. It's going to be like a Roundup Rodeo Barbecue themed. Um, again, that's not the title. That's not the name of the restaurant. Right. It's yep. just kind of a, a rodeo style themed. It's still going to be like you are in Andy's backyard. You've shrunk to the size of a toy. This is going to be like an offshoot of... His like roller coaster theme where he's now um, put three cardboard boxes, cut them up, taped them together, and now he's built like a rodeo. There's going to be, it's going to be Western themed, but he's going to have other toys, like a mishmash of toys. You know, like kids do, like, oh, I've got a dinosaur, like Trixie's in the concept art. Oh, here's Zerg. Right. You know. Oh, man. I need more Zerg in my life. Yeah. So (laughs) the the concept art kind of looks like. You're dining in Toy Story Midway Mania, like the queue. Yeah. Which is awesome. It Yeah. It's I like mean, cutouts and there's, there's supposed to be like toy pieces, um, like life size, like, or like big toys and toy like game pieces. Okay. They said that it's a barbecue themed restaurant. Doesn't mean that that's going to change because no location was given. No name was given. Right. It, only that it's going to be in Toy Story land. Yeah. But no like location within I wonder what the land. motivation was to announce it without like any specifics. Do they do that a lot? Sometimes. You pay attention to the parks yes. more, way more than I do. Yeah, sometimes. I, I mean, they say like what's 
you know, coming, but usually they say, oh, maybe, you know, like summer of 2020. Yeah. No tentative date. No, no rough date. No. Nothing. And only that it's going to be a table service restaurant. Which, which is exciting. Which is amazing. Yeah. I think it's going to be like the seventh table service restaurant with the addition of the two, I think, that are coming in Galaxy's Edge. That's, I mean, but what's cool about that is I feel like so many right times. right now there's not a lot. Yeah. I feel like in Hollywood studios, we're always doing the, the, the quick dining, mm-hmm. just the, the quick well, service. No, we always do sci-fi. We've done. Well, that's true. Um, you know, we've done Brown Derby. We've done uh, Hollywood and Vine, but that's more to meet the Disney Junior characters because right. that's a buffet. And then we've done Mama Melrose, which is the Italian. Right. Um, but that Toy Story, like the Pizza Planet closed. That was quick service, but they had, they have tables inside, but that's now Pizza Rizzo. Right. And that's only open seasonally. Which I think is kind of strange. It's very strange. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? But that's quick service anyway. <laughs> so yeah, so this will be like the that's cool. the fifth one besides whatever's opening in Galaxy's Edge. Yeah. Which I believe is two. Yeah. Well, if you want to see the concept art from it, you can either go to the Disney Parks blog or you can just, go, of course, go to our website, PixarPost.com. Click on the podcast button. And again, this is episode 64 of the Pixar Post podcast. Uh, and so you could check it out there. Um, so a couple other quick things. I just wanted to make a quick note. The forum, the Pixar Post forum, has been getting a lot of great traction. It really has. Like Toy Story 4 has been a great boom for the forum where people are talking about the toys that are coming out. They're sharing a lot of the TV spots and things that we're not able to. We can't report on every last little nugget. Mm-hmm. Um so it's really been awesome to see these people's passion that have joined and really been sharing very detailed looks at, you know, the, the toys that they're getting and which ones are coming out. So it's really cool. So if you're into that um, and just to get general other information as well, uh, in yeah, between it's very when active. Yeah. In between when we're posting, the forum has been getting some great traction lately, and I'm very excited about that. Yeah. Um, the next thing I want to talk about, just a quick uh, recap of some of the news and then some other clarity on a couple things before we get to the interview. Um, so Onward, so the film that's going to be coming out in March of 2020, mm-hmm. uh, is actually was noted to be scored by Michael and Jeff Dana. And they were the duo that did not only, well, Michael Dana did Sanjay's Super Team and Michael and Jeff as brothers did The Good Dinosaur. Mm-hmm. Um, what's funny is, as I, I told you after this was announced, when I was writing the post, I often will, if I'm writing a post about a type of movie, I will listen to a score from another mm-hmm. Pixar film that's like that. So of course, when I was writing the post about Michael and Jeff Dana, I listened to the good dinosaur. And in that I was like, wow, there are some really, really good elements that I like. But if anybody listening to this remembers when we did our review of it, the one thing I still didn't like still took me out of when I was typing. I'm like going along. It's background music at this point, just supplementing and getting me inspired is the saxophone. I still think it makes no sense to have a saxophone in these like chase scenes and things like that that were going on in The Good Dinosaur. Outside of that, I think it's a great soundtrack. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyways, I was just I was just excited about that. You know, it's nothing against, of course, I would have loved to have seen more from Thomas Newman mm-hmm. um, because anything that he's done from Wally to the Nemo films or the Finding films, yeah, uh, have been fantastic. Um, but I was just excited that you know we're getting some more takes from some other newcomers. I mean, I can't call him a newcomer at this point, but somebody that's not done as many as Randy Newman or Michael Giacchino. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of cool. Um, also, wanted to touch base on Disney Plus. So just one thing that I wanted to note that kind of has come up in questions after the fact, after we did our like announcement post for it, is that, and you pointed this out to me, that they said that it's going to be offered in 4K and HDR. Mm -hmm. But the thing that they left out is it didn't say, is that all the content or some of the content? Because when we started talking about like, You know, the classic Disney cartoons, which they still didn't clarify those classic cartoons, but you have to assume they're going to be there. I'm I'm assuming. But then we started talking about like Swiss Family Robinson, and I'm like, there's no way they're pushing 4K out of that film. No. Um, So the thing that- It's one of my favorites, too. I know you love that one. I love it. Yeah. Um, But the thing that got me thinking, though, is it didn't say 
they're going to, they said they're going to offer it in 4k, but does that mean that it's going to be an up price if you want that? You know, they've got the 699 a month or $70 or 69 a year. Yeah. Um, if you want to prepay for it, but they didn't clarify that element that if it's going to be 4k with an upcharge, they just said it'll be available. And then I also don't know how many streams at once, like Netflix has, you know, you can stream on up to two TVs or three TVs. So they didn't say it's how gonna many be streams. More, there's going to be more details coming out soon. I know. But these are the things that, you know, just and as it's going to be a dollar, a dollar, dollar two. So then you'll be like, ah, just do it. Right. And then the other thing they did, they haven't Because answered. what will we do? Ah, just do it. Well, when it, it, if it's a higher quality, then yes, I will. I also want to know if it's going to stream at a higher quality. We talked about this than the Movies Anywhere, previously Disney Movies Anywhere yes, app. You've talked about this quite a bit. Yeah. So although we sync to Disney Movies Anywhere, the audio quality is a little sloshier, just like Hulu is, which is a now majority Disney owned product, as well as. I think it's 100% Disney owned now. Uh, Comcast sold it. Oh, oh, interesting. Recently, I believe. Okay. I know there were still some like other last people week. that were involved in there, but that's interesting. I'm going to have to look I, into that now. I think I'm... I like it. I mean, now I'm like guessing, so I can guess myself, but I am <laughs> I believe I read that Comcast Wait, sold their... Wait, what, what was the question the other night? I don't even okay. remember. Yeah, there was another question the other night that... We were... I have confidence, but it doesn't mean that I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> um, Nobody will second guess if you're confident. That's right. Just go with it. So yeah, Disney owns it. <laughs> there you go. Um, so yeah, and then the other thing is, is how soon after a release, you know, they said Toy Story 4 will be released on the service, but is it going to be on a delay? So is Toy Story 4 going to come out on Blu-ray 4K discs in stores Oh, or to purchase digitally, and then it will be streaming later on Disney Plus? Or is it going to be on launch day on Disney Plus if you're a paid subscriber? Oh, I... So that's something we'll I would have to find almo- out too. I would almost think that it would be delayed. It it feels like it would be. I mean, we're two to two to f- six weeks. Uh, that might be too soon. Yeah. I don't know. It's going to be interesting. I don't know. I think it would be delayed for people to buy it. I think so I mean, too. We'll buy it. We're, well, of course we are because we're going to still need to get all the Blu-ray extras mm-hmm. or 4K extras. Um, just to clarify too. Uh, Lamp Life, the short, will be out during year one, which is the Bo Peep-centric short. Um, I don't know how long it's going to be. They didn't say if it's like a TV special length, like where it's like 20 minutes, or if it's going to be like a five-minute, seven-minute mm-hmm. thing. Um, and then also Forky Asks a Question will be available at the at launch uh, for Disney+. Plus, and that's ten a series of 10 shorts. I'm guessing those are going to be like the minute and a half. Two like, minutes. Like Cars tunes or Shorty Shorts. Yeah. Like when they did those. Because it'll probably be like, you know, what what is what is yogurt? Or just something silly that, you know. He's <laughs> gonna, yogurt. Yeah, he'll just say it and be silly and it'll move on. Ki- I mean, kids and us are going to love it. <laughs> Our son loves Forky. Forky and Giggle. Yeah. Yep. I don't know why. It's just he's... They've got the silliest voices. Yeah, you're right. I mean, they're the ones that are going to attract kids. But yeah, those are the ones. One of the other questions that has been out there is Monsters at Work, the the show. Mm-hmm. Is that going to be 2D or 3D? So we're, we, we're not going to throw 100% on this, but from sources, we have heard it's 3D. Um, so that's great. Mm-hmm. So keep that in mind. That's not announced. Um but we're, we also are not going to go out on a limb and say 100% confidence just because it hasn't been announced. But from sources, we've heard that it's 3D. So that's cool. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, also, people were asking about Randy. Randall, so, uh, you know, in, from Monsters, Inc. and University, they're like, he wasn't announced. Where did he go? So this is after Monsters, Inc. Right. We now know that laughter is powering the city. And we're following this other Tylor monster that, you know, wants to work his way up to be a Mike and Sully type character. Well, he went to the the human world. You just have to, he was like banished. Oh, that's true. He was banished. Yeah. But Mike and Sully got back. Yeah, but doesn't They were mean banished. He was. <laughs> yeah, I know. Because the... Mama, get the, get yeah, the shovel. Be, There's another gator. Yeah, because the Yeti... The abominable, adorable snowman, I should say. Yeah. <laughs> He's still out there. Yeah. And King Itchy. 
So anyways, people are just wondering about him, but I doubt it. Um, we also just, you know, they're, they're really pushing Billy Crystal and, uh, John Goodman. Which is amazing. Uh, oh, absolutely them. amazing that they got them to be a part of it. Um, but I have to assume since we're following this Tylor monster that it's going to be his story yeah. and Mike and Sully are going to be there once in a while. Right. I agree. Yeah. It'll be definitely strong in the kickoff episode. Uh, in and, probably like two or three episodes and then they'll yeah. like fizzle and just be. Yep. I'm hoping it becomes a series. Yeah. Um, I'm excited to see anything else monsters related. The world is fantastic. The colors are fantastic. That's why I love Toy Story. The world is great. The colors are great. The story's great. Mm -hmm. The voices are fantastic. Plus, you know I like my big casts. I know you do. Lots of characters mean lots of ways that you can move that story around. All right, so then the other thing kind of springing off of Monsters at Work is Billy Crystal at the Grauman's Chinese Theater, which technically has a different name now, but everybody still calls it that. Mm-hmm. Um, we wrote a post on it. I don't want to, it's, it's kind of older at this point. It's like two weeks ago. Yeah. I, but the thing that still I just feel like I need to talk about is how amazing it is that he has an entire plethora of work He's now, abs- you should say, like, the Grauman's Chinese Theaters where, yes, please where celebrities go and they put their feet and their handprints and their signature into wet cement. Right. And then it's displayed for everyone to see right. for years and years and years and to come. And it's always fun because then you can go up to it, you can put your hand on in theirs the and be like, wow, look how small or big their hand is as opposed to mine yeah. or whatever. In the courtyard in Hollywood. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying. You're welcome. I'm taking that in for In front granted. of the theater. <laughs> I'm taking that uh, for granted there. Um, but... He's had an amazing career for decades. decades. Yeah, oh, jinx. <laughs> and to think how big of a Yankee fan he is, mm-hmm. to think about the comedy that he's done, the amount of money he's raised for charities that he's been a part of, the movies he's been a part of, When Harry Met Sally. You know, I mean, that's the first one that comes to my mind. And but I think, I think he did this on like the 30th and, anniversary of When Harry Met Sally. Yeah. So to I mean, Rob Reiner introduced him, right? Which they're like BFFs, right? <laughs> um, and just to think that he took after putting in his feet and hands, a foot molded after Mike Wazowski, which they said in the news report that Pixar provided mm-hmm. to put that foot into a Mike Wazowski foot, a Mike Wazowski foot into the concrete next to his own feet is now granted you pointed this out to me it's not like he could put harry and sally's feet you know like he was a character but he still could have scratched like an the new york yankee logo Mm -hmm. or something else to show how much he loves this character he could have said like an iconic line or something he could have scribbled something else on there yeah he could have done anything else but it just shows how much that these characters mean to these vocal actors and what it's meant to their life. Well, he's said in so many interviews how much that's meant to him. And didn't he say like how disappointed he was for Toy Story? Because didn't he want Toy Story? He was originally, yeah, he was trying out for Buzz Lightyear. And he was so bummed. He turned it down. Yeah. And then after he saw how great Toy Story was, he was like, ooh, I got to be in something. And then they talked to him about Mike. But what a great... Turn of events. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> you don't... I don't see Billy Crystal without thinking of Mike Wazowski and vice versa. Correct. Yeah, exactly. I mean, they're they're one and the same. And who it's storming out. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. If you, can hear some, if you can hear some thunder, <laughs> it's not picking it up in these high-quality mics. Um, <laughs> it might. It might. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting closer. Um, so the other thing I wanted to do, and I just realized I had... Such an amazing transition out of that into the Toy Story 4 interview. And I almost went right for it because of how good the transition was. And if I thought about this more, I would have set it up that way, but I didn't. Oh, man. Um, so I'll I'll bring that back up in a second. But the, <laughs> the last thing I wanted to kind of talk about before we go into the interview is about the Spark Shorts. So there was an additional interview on NPR um, that... Everywhere else, the I mean, the news that had been released previously about the Spark Shorts was too similar to this for us to do a post on it. There was really one little nugget mm-hmm. that was in there that was new news to us after reporting on it. And it was really talking about um, 
their plan for what they're going to do. And we had asked the question in our two podcasts ago where we said, is this the end of official feature film shorts? Because we went to the Toy Story 4 event. There was no short film that we saw. And we always see the short film. Mm -hmm. There was no discussion of short film. I think it's, we said, we think it's done. Mm -hmm. We don't want it to be done, but we think it is. Because this Spark Shorts format, you can listen to that episode if you want to know our reasons why we think it's done. But here's something else that sort of supports that. So uh, Lindsay Collins, uh, who is one of the producers, uh, well, she was the producer of Finding Penny Dory. Dory. She's done a lot of other things at the studio. And then she's also one of the lead people in charge of dealing with yeah, She's like with an these. executive producer with the Spark Shorts, I believe. Exactly. They said the plan is to do two to four Spark Shorts per year outside of the six planned for 2019. So that was already like, oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. And then so there and then she was quoted as saying, so there's not this sense of like, oh, my gosh, I have to go out in front of Incredibles 2 and I'm bearing this huge burden of this has to be the most amazing short film ever. So does that reaffirm that they're basically saying I don't have to go out in front of Incredibles 2? I'm not bearing this burden. Yeah. That it has to be the best short ever that. Oh, maybe you heard that lightning I know. <laughs> <laughs> or thunder. I, yeah. So maybe you, you can hear lightning. <laughs> <laughs> you can, if it strikes right next to you. Yeah. Um, I mean, I really think it's, I think they're changing format. Yeah. I think it's, they're just mixing it up. Especially if they're planning on doing that many. Cause like we talked about, they've only got so much render time. Yeah. I think they're just trying a different formula. Yeah. I mean, and it also is getting like the talent kind of mixed around and, yep. you know, people spreading their wings yep. within the studio. Yep. Um, which, you know, could be a good thing. Yeah, for sure. But we wanted to talk about that because that kind of supported our theory that we were putting out there yeah, that they I might be I think our done. theory is right. Yeah. Um, so before we get to the interview, and I've said that a bunch, where I was going to go back from is Billy Crystal talking about uh, how much he uh, loves this character and how much it means to him. Mm -hmm. One of the things I was going to talk about leading into this interview was how much Tom Hanks and Josh Cooley talks about this, that Tom Hanks has expressed his gratitude for this character and things that he was saying to Josh about it. So it, it was great to, to hear not only about Tom Hanks and his respect for the characters, but then also how much Josh didn't take this for granted how he kind of talked about the fact that Andrew Stanton had said that the first three Toy Story films were built to be like a bookend that you can, it's a story about Andy and Woody. You can put it on the bookshelf, but then it's over, but is it? Mm -hmm. So then they determined that there's all these other things that they could do with it. If all of a sudden they took him out of that scenario and they did because they gave him to Bonnie, but now what happens in Bonnie's room? They're, they say that, you know, there, these other toys Bonnie had already known ahead of Woody. So the, Woody was not her favorite. She just liked to play with them. Right. So he's no longer the favorite. So it's like, what happened there? So Andrew Stanton was still involved at the beginning of this doing, he was, he's been involved in either writing or contributing to each of the Toy Story films. So it was interesting hearing some of those comments that have come through as well from Andrew and then from what Josh was talking about. You're not going to hear the Andrew comments in this conversation, but we're going to be sharing more of them. But in, in any regard, uh, let's listen to the conversation with uh, Josh Cooley, the director, Mark Nielsen, one of the producers, and uh, we'll follow up after this interview. I guess my first question for you guys is, uh, what was the intimidation level like coming into this franchise as well? Um, what's the highest number you can possibly think of? <laughs> like double that number. Ooh, yeah. That's pretty high. Uh, for me, it was uh, extremely intimidating. Right out the gate, it's such a huge, like you said, and, and Toy Story is so important, not just to the studio, but kind of to the world. And a lot of people grew up with it, and uh, myself included. And so it kind of blew my mind just to even be working on it, and then to... You know, taking it the next step. It was just, it was super intimidating. Um, the great thing is we have so many people here, you, you've met today already on the cat, on the crew that um, 
and the cast that have worked on all the Toy Story films. So we were it was in good hands at all times. Yeah, these characters just mean so much to us at the studio, right? It's like the crown jewels to us. And like the, the Woody and Buzz are in the fabric of this place. And I think the spirit of those characters is kind of infused in all the characters that we've put in all of our films. So uh, to tackle this was uh, was a challenge. It was intimidating, but also a great pleasure. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of us have been here for a long time and have gotten to work on some of the other films and sort of go back into that world was exciting and we had animators for example that have grown up with these characters that were showing us pictures of themselves dressed as Buzz Lightyear at, in, at Halloween in first grade uh, that are now getting to open up shots and animate those characters so it's special so why Toy Story 4? Like, was that always the plan to continue after 3? the um to answer the first question, why Toy Story 4? That was the thing that got me interested in this film. Like, why make another one? Because I had the same questions. And um, but then the more we thought about it, I was like, well, this, it's a, it's you know, the, every ending is a new beginning, that kind of thing. So it's what is next for Woody? Because there, there's no way that he's going to be having the same experience in Bonnie's room that he had in Andy's room. And all of a sudden, it just kind of started to blossom and all these new ideas come, kind of started to grow. Like, how would he handle the situation? And that's always the best kind of scenario to have a character that you know really well, and but in a situation you've never seen. I think for a sequel, that's kind of the best situation. So um, it just kept kind of kept growing and growing. And um, the, 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 you know, it was the second part of your question, uh, was there always a plan? Uh, I think that there was the thought that if there's a story worth telling we're going to tell it and uh, so it, it, you know it's kind of the same way our stories always kind of organically grow this one just kind of grew like that yeah and Andrew Stanton um, when we talked to him in the beginning of this uh, said that he'd always kind of thought of the first three Toy Story movies as like a, a three volume set you know that you could put on a shelf right it was it was life with Andy um, so the idea of this also kind of sprung out of the idea of, of, of a new beginning and it, just a new chapter in the life of Woody. Uh, we knew there was a lot more that Woody could learn and ways that he could grow. Um, he's in a new situation now. He's in a new room. Uh, the toys are all kind of blended from, from his old room and this new room. So uh, there was a lot of potential and growth for Woody in this. Right. Um, so I think that Don Rickles is still voicing Mr. Potato Head and all yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, so he, he passed a couple of years back, um, and we were contacted by his family, I think his agent as well, and they asked, he had, he had signed on to do the project before he passed, and we were excited about that, um, but after he passed, his, his family contacted us and said, is there any possible way he's been doing Mr. Potato Head for over 25 years, can you create a performance out of uh, material? And so we went back through all of the outtakes for all the films, all the shorts, all the video games, all the ice capades shows, uh, every possible thing. And there is a lot of Don Rickles. And so it was actually, I wouldn't say it was easy, but th there, was, um, there was a lot to work with. And um, so I'm very, very, very honored that he's he's in this film. Yeah, it's it's an honor to all of us. I mean, he's such a big part of these movies, and every time you see a potato head toy, you hear his voice in your head. Yeah. Um, so the idea of doing this without him was one we didn't want to have to consider. Yeah. And the editorial team did a great job. A lot of mining through yeah. through takes. With uh, the vocal talent, we've got uh, a big cast that's come in so, uh, that you're familiar with, as well as some new folks. Yes. Of the new gang, uh, who are you guys most excited about, and what was that experience working with them in the vocal booth? And then just real quick, I heard Bill Hader in here again. <laughs> Is he officially becoming the the true that it was joked upon at D23 Expo that he's now the, <laughs> the updated <laughs> Lucky Charm? Uh, I don't know if I can confirm that, but um, Bill's a you know we worked on Inside Out together, so Bill's a friend, and and I said, uh, hey, I'd love for you to do a voice on Toy Story Four, and he goes, yeah, man, whatever you want. Yeah. <laughs> so um, <laughs> uh, so I was uh, we had to have him in there. So um, 
uh, he's in there. But uh, man, I don't think I can pick a single person that's like the, the most fun of the best. This cast is unbelievable, and um, Key and Peele. Just watching them work is just was a dream come true, and just amazing to see how those guys can like literally share a brain between each other and know what the other person's going to say. Um, Ali Mackey is just lights up the room. Christina like got the, got the part immediately. Keanu is just the coolest guy in the world, and I'm just want to be friends with him forever. Uh, yeah, just, we love Tony Hale and Tony Forky. Hale. Uh, definitely a standout for me. We got to spend a lot of time with him because he's got such a big role in this project. Yeah. And uh, just his reaction when he heard about the character and we were describing what it was going to be like to him, when he heard this is a character that asked the question, why am I alive? He's like, that, that, I want that. That's it. I count me in. And um, he's just been a, been a pleasure. Such a funny guy and brought so much to Forky. And he has a lot of heart, too, for, in real life. So you can, he, yeah. he brings it in the performance. Thanks. Yeah. So, in the same lane of that question, when you guys do the scratch tracks for this film, how different are the scratch track performances than the ones that you end up going with with the, the, the name people? Because mm-hmm. I know, I'm pretty sure that the scratch track people aren't celebrities, right? Correct, yeah. We, we have so many good actors here in the studio that just can do great voices. And um, the, the benefit of doing Toy Stories, we all know what these characters sound like. So I can walk up there and do the Woody lines for Scratch because we all, you know, it's although my acting is right up there with Tom Hanks, it's very difficult <laughs> uh, to, to choose. But uh, you know, we, we try and match the energy more than the the vocal, you know, quality to sound like the person. But what about the newer character like like Forky? For someone that what you don't know, what yeah. you want Forky to sound like <laughs> just yet. Yeah, it's just kind of getting the attitude of the character, and then because we always do the scratch first, and then we go, well, who, what, which actor out there would would um, match up right for this character? So it's never trying to, not never trying to predict what they're going to sound like, but the, the, their um, how they'll feel more than the actual sound. Of it. We we do try to record the the actor kind of early ish in our process. You know, it takes four to five years to make these movies, but we try to get them in as soon as we've cast them, at least to one recording session to get their voice in, uh, in case we do need to make adjustments to the animation or the approach to the character. Because you know, as as great as the the people of Pixar are at acting, it, it does take a leap and it goes oh, in yeah. a very specific direction once you've got that actor cut in. I will add real quickly that the thing that was really exciting is we recorded Tom and Annie together in the first session. Uh, the first session on this film, we recorded them together because we knew that there's going to be a lot of them between each other. And we just, you know, it's been years since they've been on screen together. We didn't know how it would sound. Annie sounded exactly like Toy Story 1 Annie from 25 years earlier. Like we put, we played clips side by side. You could not tell a difference at all. It was pretty amazing. And, and they had never recorded together either. That was surprising. They both were like, we've only been solo in the booth all these years. It was the first time they yeah. recorded at the same time in a session. I was going to say, because usually everybody records separately. They hardly ever yeah. yeah. Jordan Peele and Keegan-Michael Key also, we tried to get them together whenever we could. Right? You had Their to. energy, they you feed off of each other. <laughs> you know, And you give them the lines, and they will give you a really different, interesting take on it every time. It's different. But. <laughs> Um, inspiration for Forky, just really unique character, Spork. Um, I mean, who actually does that in a film other than Pixar? But I'm thinking um, back to like Wally, where there's that section where Wally has the spoon <laughs> yeah. and the fork. I mean, is there any linking like that with the past movies, or what can you tell us about that inspiration? The I'll tell you what, the inspiration was we were sitting in the story room and we were joking about how our kids make will take the the Christmas present and they'll play with the box before they play with the actual toy sometimes. And so we were just going, well, does that mean the box comes to life? Like, how would that work? And it was just, we were going down this bizarre path. And then we said, well, what if, what if she, what if you made it, what if Bonnie actually made a toy? We've never seen that in Toy Story. And that was something that anything that we haven't done in Toy Story, it was like, okay, let's see where that goes. Because uh, number four, there's a lot of things that have happened already. And you don't want to retread down the same steps. So it became this bizarre experiment, and it just was too funny not to try it. And it was paying off, so we just kept going. (laughs) Great.
the, the Wally connection is a funny one. I hadn't thought about that until yesterday when our rendering team took the shot from Wally and they re rendered it with Forky in it and put it up on the screen for us oh, and did it as a gag. And it was really funny. It was pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In, yeah. You need to release right. that. <laughs> pretty great. I just want to follow up on the recording together that Tom and Andy. I was wondering. Because they've never recorded together, like you said. Yeah. Were there any sparks in the recording session where mm-hmm. you see that really adds to the story? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, they, they, there's both of them are so quick. They're so funny and quick witted, and they, they, it was like watching like a, a boxing match or something where they could just they're right there alongside each other, and that that was kind of the first time together was just to double check that they had that, that there was. You can feel a relationship there, and it, out the gate, it was like, "Oh, we're, we're good." So. Yeah, it made a big a big difference in the performance of both of them in mm-hmm. their scenes, having them being able to interact with each other that way. Yeah, a lot of the scenes were there together, were recorded together. Yeah, we were lucky we got to do that because that, usually that's not the case. I know that uh, one of the distinctive qualities of a Pixar film is are the stories. But talking with the artists this morning, I was just so impressed with that. The work that they do. Yeah. Are we there with the animation? Have we reached the full potential of animation? Do you think? I don't think so. No, I don't. I don't think it's, it'll ever be something that we can. Every every story is different, you know, and that requires a different style of animation. Um, that's like saying, I think, have we seen the best basketball player of all time? You know, I don't think that's a thing. It's amazing, though, to see how much better they've gotten at their craft over time. You know, a lot of these animators have been here for a long time, and every film, they just blow us away with the subtlety in in the acting that they're able to achieve. And so we're just so thrilled at the animation in this film. It does feel like the bar is higher than it's been. In in fact, I had to pull him back on Forky. The first couple tests, he was very, he looked beautiful. And I said, no, he needs to be crappier. (laughs) (laughs) He needs to, because he's so different from all the other toys in this world, he he should have like a handmade quality to the way that he's that he's uh, moved. So almost like a kid going like this, like he's being played with. And uh, I had to keep say no no blinks, take the eye blinks out, like let him. And so it was an f- interesting challenge <laughs> to make it worse. The, the first minutes, the footage that we saw, the exterior scenes, mm-hmm. when, it was, when it was raining, it looked so real. Yeah. Yeah, the the rendering, the ability to render detail and, and believable images is is also well beyond where we've been in the past. And yeah, that was the biggest kind of effect scene in the film. They really put yeah. a lot of love and care into that, the lighting, the effects. Um, but yeah, it's 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 pretty amazing. We always have to strike that balance between realism. Uh, but also kind of respecting the caricature of the world and of the characters. You know, the humans that we have in this world don't look photo real, and it would be kind of creepy if we did go that way. So you just don't want to get out of balance between the look of the sets and the world and the characters. So in Toy Story 3, the daycare was very prison-like, and I was reading that the research, the animators, you know, they did research on like all prison movies. So in Toy Story 4... It feels like Gabby Gabby and Auntie Small is like a straight up horror film. It comes out of the crayon like a vampire out of the coffin. And then the Trilogy dolls are like, you know, Frankenstein monster and just like, they've got the, you know, the creature movement. So did you guys study like all the horror films to kind of draw and this one's here is cool. <laughs> <laughs> I love scary movies. Not not gory movies. I like just the scary ones. And um, uh, antique stores are creepy. The, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of history in them, and uh, that's what's cool about them. Though at the same time, there's a lot of every single item has like a story behind it. And so when we were looking at the antique stores, we had cameras on sticks. I don't know if they show any footage today, but like they would run it down along the, the ground. And, and there's so much stuff in between the shelves and spider webs, and it just looks like a haunted house. And so, uh, and, and every single antique store we went to had a ventriloquist dummy in the corner <laughs> just staring at it. it. Seriously, every single one of them. The jaws usually just like hang in there. So we had to put that in. And, uh, but there's just... Uh, 
also just it's a different flavor from the prison or the uh, you know the, the school so it's a sad place too for for a toy to be you know <laughs> it's, it, toys if they're in a toy store they've got they've got hope for a bright future um, but if they're in an antique store they've had they've had a prior life and there's no real hope for what's coming next you don't yeah. see a lot of kids in antique stores looking for toys it's like so, a retirement home it's like a retirement home yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sorry <laughs> Uh, on that historical note, there's a lot of nods to real life toy history, and mm. you, you're homaging Chad Cathy, the, the stunt cycle, yeah. all of that stuff, and then there's some real life toys like Kenner Star Wars popping up in the background. Mm -hmm. What was sort of the process to populate the new world with things that were tied into genuine history over the last 50, 60 years? Well, the, the the original Toy Story did the same thing with Mr. Potato Head, with Slinky Dog. Like it, you almost forget, like those were real toys before Toy Story even existed. And so, um, I wanted to see stuff that I grew up with, and that because that was, I think that's what made Toy Story so familiar immediately on the, the first one. So, having um, homage to those um, those speaking dolls. Um, also, I mean, anybody around my age grew up playing with those Kenner Star Wars toys, and so and it's like one of the biggest toy lines of, of all time. So it just felt natural that it had to be in there. Um, so now, usually it's just Woody and Buzz being the main characters, but now we have Bo injected in their lives more. Mm -hmm. And so at what point did that become like, let, let's, you know some f female power in the movie. Like, it was also happening at Incredibles, mm -hmm, the last mm -hmm, one. So, mm -hmm. is that sort of the theme now, or was that decided a long time ago? That was decided a long time ago. That was kind of, that was the... I'd say that was pretty much the foundation of, of having a fourth film. That was all... Bo Peep was always part of that. And, and so... Um, yeah, the code, yeah, the code name we've had for our film, we've described it internally as Peep. That's what we've called the film, you know, for the whole five years we've been working on it, you know. Yeah. We knew Bo, Bo was such a great uh, character in the earlier films, but, but we hadn't seen her. Uh, she wasn't in three. She's only in one and two in very small ways, but we hadn't described, like, what had happened to her. So it was really intriguing to us in digging into the story to develop a backstory for her. Where did she go? What's it, what's it like out there? Has she been with a kid? Is she living on her own? So it was just a rich thing to explore. And um, so we really grabbed onto that. Yeah, we basically got to reinvent her. And uh, we went back and looked at the other films, like the amount of screen time, I want to say like seven minutes yeah, on both films, totally. and that's it. And uh, that includes every single frame that has her in it. And so we watched that and we're like, oh, we this is, she wasn't fully... She has character, but she wasn't completely. She wasn't a protagonist or anything. So, we had the ability to go in there and kind of just build upon what was already there. Uh, I'm curious, what's more difficult to direct, or what's more difficult for the animators, uh, redoing characters that are established like Woody and Buzz, or adding newer characters or updates on a character like Bo Peep? What's harder to direct and, and get right? Well, there's definitely new ground with a new character that nobody's ever animated before. Um, the benefit of having Woody and Buzz is that there's a, animators here that have done Woody and Buzz. They've kind of unlocked them, in a sense. They know the what you can and can't do. So that makes life a little easier, but you also don't want to tread on the same exact things you've done before. So there, I'd say it just depends on the animator and also just kind of depends on what the, what the project is. From a story perspective, one of the challenges of having Woody and Buzz is they, they have been so established, you know, everybody feels like they've already got a relationship with them. So when you're exploring what they can do or what they need to learn or where they could go, uh, people have opinions all around about what, what that could be or should be. So I feel it was really challenging yeah. to us in telling the story of Woody um, to to make sure it felt true to the audience that this is this is something this is something Woody would struggle with. This is a journey he would go on. These are decisions Woody would make. And that's just because of the, of the love for these characters. People are so invested in them, and it's almost like don't do anything wrong with my kid. You, I'm watching you. you know? So it's a big responsibility. <laughs> How excited was Tom Hanks to come back to the character? What does this character mean to him? Oh man! Well, I'll tell you, uh, the last session we had with him, 
it was pretty um, pretty emotional. At the end, we we had our last. We, I think we brought him in for like maybe twenty lines, not not very much, and uh, we said thanks, you know, and and he. He said this character means the world to me and my family, and I've been you know doing it for almost thirty years. So, it's it's it was really touching, and uh, yeah, it means a lot. Yeah, to him. it was a, it was a big deal. It was a big deal to him, and it was very he was incredibly invested in the story, and he really grabbed onto it and really loved it from the start, um, and uh, yeah, just was excited to have another adventure kind of with this character. It's amazing. I don't know how many actors play the same role like this for over 25 years. Yeah, good but, point. you know, they had, he, he was reflecting on the ages of, of his children as it was associated with which film he was working on at the time. Uh, and, Annie Potts as well talked about, you know, the birth, the birth of her child happening, you know, around the time of the first one. And so it's, it's a reflective period for them whenever we would record them. The, one of the most terrified moments I was was pitching the story to Tom because he knows that world and that character better than anybody and I just wanted to do right you know, by that and so he came in he's like alright what are we doing what's going on <laughs> and so I, I started pitching it and we got to the classroom scene which you guys saw and he went all right, you got me. Okay. I don't know how you're doing this. All right, keep going. So that's why I went, oh, thank goodness. And same thing with Tim, too. Once he, once I pitched it to him, he was like, okay, I see what this is. And uh, it gives, gives you the confidence to keep going. It's kind of a two-parter. The first thing is it's a little bit of a compliment, but I think it's something that you did so well. Um, in the first 20 minutes of the film that we saw yesterday, there's this wonderful... Um, homage to all the films, and there's this classic trip down memory lane and nostalgia, but you never overdid it, so I just wanted to say, Thanks. how did you find that perfect balance? But then, my second part is, do you see this as the next saga for this, this these characters? Do you feel like you're, you are like the toy story for the new generation? Are you creating that? Uh, thank you for the compliment. The uh, That was... I think Garrett boarded that. Garrett? Yeah, Garrett Sheldon. One of our story artists had the idea of, like, what if you did it all as one shot? And I was like, whoa, how would you do that? Mm. That's super cool. And so... When the Randy, you know, the music came up, you got a friend of me, and I'm like... Yeah. Okay. Like, well, that was the thing. That was it. That was really important to, to make it feel... Make everybody feel... Uh, all of this feels like a warm bath. Like this is what I love. This is what I've been through, and to lyrically show that, and then let that transition of Woody to Bonnie be something that feels smooth and, and effortless. Um, so that the same way that all of us feel watching that, that's how Woody feels inside when he's in this new situation. So that was really important to get that. Um, the second part of your question. I don't know what the future holds, but I like to think that even if uh, if no more films are made, that that's, you would feel that story continue, if that makes sense. Yeah, going back to that that, that playtime montage at the beginning, uh, it reminded us of, of Up and working on the Married Life montage where you know Ronnie Del Carmen had boarded that. Garrett Sheldrew is just such a beautiful artist. He drew he drew this out, this idea of this one shot kind of playtime, and it was another one of those moments where we knew we didn't want to mess it up when we put it in the animation and in the layout. You did, we didn't want to mess with kind of the poetic and the and the sweet feel of, of what had been storyboarded. Uh, how does it feel of having John Lasseter here and not being able to ask for his advice on the work he created and um, the characters he basically birth Pixar? Yeah. Yeah, it's you know it's it's been a year and a half now since John left, and uh, it was a really difficult uh, time for the studio. It's been a time of transition. Uh, but honestly, I have to say, I am so proud of the way that the studio has responded. Um, they, it's so important to us at Pixar uh, that we're telling just the greatest stories that we can. And, and to do that, you know, this has to be an environment where, where people feel uh, supported and one that's, that's safe where, where people can speak their minds. So as challenging as it's been, uh, there's a lot of optimism about the future. 
Uh, Pete Doctor, you know, is our chief creative officer. He goes back to the beginnings of the studio. And there's so much respect for, for Pete, both as a director, as an executive producer, which he was on this film, and as a chief creative um, executive. Uh, he is he's just providing a lot of just great leadership and allowing the filmmakers a lot of freedom. And so there's we know that there's, there's a bright future and a lot of optimism uh, at the studio. There's a lot of great films in development all lined up to be kind of the next films after us. So as difficult as the transition's been, there's a lot of hope about the future. This is a little bit of a side note off that, but I was thinking about the other day how lucky I was that I got to work with every single one of the original creators of Toy Story. Um, Joe, I was, I'm in the studio because Joe Ramp brought me in. Um, I got to, I've worked with John, I've worked with Pete, worked with Andrew and Lee and, you know, Jeff Pidge and every, all of them. And so, uh, that was, I didn't really thought about it, but, um, uh, just thought it was really cool. And our executive producers, you know, Andrew, Lee and Pete were so supportive on this show and were available anytime for anything we needed, anytime we needed to consult or work things through with them. Their just rich history with these characters going all the way back was incredibly valuable oh, to yeah. us on this project. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks everybody. All right, so there's the interview with Josh and Mark. And can I say one thing about what I'm really excited about? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I have never been in one of their press photos before. I know I mentioned that ahead of time. Uh -huh. But there is one of me and Mark right after I asked my question. You mean Josh? Josh, thank you. <laughs> you got to keep me honest with I these know. things. I, I flub up like that. I flub up names. I switch names if I'm thinking about multiple people. But um, You've never changed my name, so that's good. <laughs> High five. <laughs> yeah, that was not slapping each other. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah so uh, yeah, so Josh was like smiling right back at me. It's like I it's was a like, great photo. I was like, this is very exciting it's for me. It's a great photo. Because every event I've been to, you're in them. Mm -hmm. You're like if you go, you're you're in these photos, and then I go and I'm like, oh man, I'm never in any of these photos. Well, what's funny is I'm downstairs and I, I think I was cleaning something in the kitchen and you yell up. You're like, you're in your office and you yell downstairs and you're like, I know, that's what he calls me. And he's like, <laughs> he's like, come, come here, come here. And I'm thinking something's wrong. No, like his it computer, wasn't that serious. I, I don't know. Like <laughs> computer smoking or something. But we got the download and he's for like, all the press Look. materials. Yeah. I was excited. I know you were. Yeah. Um, it was fun hearing his explanation about Bill Debbie Hader. Debbie did a good picture. It wasn't Debbie in the room oh, no. on that time. No, oh. I, I don't know this gentleman's name, but he's been there the last couple of oh, press okay. releases. Um, and he got a new mirrorless camera, so you don't even hear the shutter. Ooh. Yeah. Oh, I know. All, you've told me. <laughs> I'm, I'm hip. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, so and, and just in general, um, I was excited to hear more about uh, t uh, Tom Hanks and uh, Annie Potts working together, recording some of their lines of dialogue and how they had never done that before, mm -hmm. how... You hear because why would they? They never. It wasn't enough dialogue, right? You like know? they talk about, like you know, when Josh talked about the fact that there's seven minutes of total screen time that Bo Peep is in Toy Story one or two. Yeah, like they're they're saying like that includes non speaking time that she's right. in the frame. Right, like that's wild to think that that's it. Um, but it was just really cool hearing that they were able to do some of those lines together. I feel like each movie they've been kind of doing this a little more mm -hmm. with like the characters that matter together. Like they talked about, you know, Key and Peel recording together, but it's like, well, they better have. Yeah. <laughs> they better have. <laughs> they need to bounce off each other. Yeah, for sure. And I can't wait for that on the Blu-ray extras. Oh. I hope they have some great sidebars from them. Oh, of course. Yeah. Um, so anyways, uh, oh, I also and had Tony to Hale. Oh, yeah. Especially I also, since we've been watching Veep. Oh, yeah. We've been binging on Veep. Yep. Season seven. We're caught up. <laughs> uh, but then it was, um, in general, just funny hearing about their excursions going to antique shops as their research trips versus, like, going to Paris for Ratatouille and mm -hmm. all these, you know, far out places for other films. They're going to antique shops. Dusty and, antique shops. Yeah. Yeah. They're talking about all the details and everything. 
So what do you think? Does that about wrap up the show? I think so. This I is think a long it, one. I think it does for this one, yeah. But uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed it. So that wraps up this, this episode of the Pixar Post podcast. Be sure to follow us on all of our social media channels, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Pinterest, or subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Overcast, or wherever you get your podcasts. Lastly, if you like today's show, let us know. Please do rate us on Apple Podcasts, leave a comment on our site, or send us an email at info at pixarpost.com. Signing off as usual, I'm TJ. And I'm Julie. And be sure to stay tuned to pixarpost.com all week for the latest Pixar news. Bye-bye.